This is level one of the CFA program, the topic on corporate issuers and the reading on capital structure. There are two main decisions made by the executive leadership team. The first one occurs on the left-hand side of the balance sheet, which we've already talked about. This, of course, is capital budgeting, which is the process of planning for the purchase of long-term assets. If you remember from those earlier recordings, what I want you to do is I want you to think of not so much in terms of the long-term assets, but the product lines and services that are generated by those assets. The second important decision is what we're faced with today in this particular reading, how to pay for those long-term assets. That's what capital structure is. It's the mix of debt and equity. So our question then becomes, when we find a project that has an expected positive net present value, how do we pay for it? Do we use internally generated funds or we go to the external markets, maybe to the bond market or maybe to the stock market? So this is one of my, this is one of my favorite lectures that I give my students. We'll talk about capital structure and its simplest form. And as we get to the end of the slide deck, we'll complexify it just a little bit. So notice there are just a handful of learning outcome statements, but I'm guessing you've looked at the reading and this is a fairly long reading and we probably have about 45 or 50 slides here. So uh, this is not going to be a short, uh, a short recording. So what are we going to start with? Factors affecting capital structure, how it changes uh, over, a li over its lifetime. We're going to go back to 1958 and Franco Medigliani and Merton Miller, which remains to this day my favorite academic journal article. And we'll talk about target capital structure and then competing stakeholder interests, which has kind of been a theme here in, uh, in this particular uh, series of readings. So let's go ahead and start with just the basics here. Explain factors affecting capital structure. And so I think I gave you this definition, but let me read what uh, comes right out of the reading. Specific combination of debt and equity used to finance the company's assets. All right, so what do we do here? If we want to issue shares of stock, and remember, what we're doing is we're asking other investors to become owners, or at least part owners, in, uh, in the company. Uh, it's expensive. Of course, the cost of equity is the, uh, is the highest cost of any source of capital out there. It's permanent in the sense that uh, uh, when a company issues shares of stock, there is, no, there is no maturity date. I mean, you can own a share of stock for the rest of your life and you could, uh, you could will those shares to your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. As long as the company exists, then those, those shares will exist. Now, there is some flexibility that we'll go ahead and talk about throughout this reading. Debt, of course, is cheaper. Uh, typically, bonds have a maturity date. And I've said this to you before, but I think it's worth repeating that a lot of bonds have maturities of 30 years, but there's nothing interesting in a 30-year maturity. Uh, could be 20 years, could be 10 years. I've probably given you the example of Walt Disney and Coca-Cola issuing 100-year bonds. And this is uh, how I explain it, that when a company issues bonds, it makes an explicit promise to repay the principal and, and to pay the interest. Now let's get specifically to this LOS. So what are some internal factors? Of course, uh, the existing leverage of the firm, think of leverage back in our financial statement days, just, just think of a simple debt equity ratio. And so if the firm has tons and tons of debt, in its capital structure, it's probably going to be at least limited or somewhat limited. I mean, maybe substantially limited in its ability to use debt financing. So the existing leverage, think of the debt equity, uh, debt equity uh, ratio. And then the business model characteristics. I mean, some firms like a company like uh, John Deere, which, you know, they have tons of factories. And so they got these huge pieces of equipment in there, metal stamping machines to, uh, to make lawnmowers and tractors and all the other farm equipment that John Deere makes, you know, they probably lend it, lends itself very readily for the access to the cheaper debt financing. So companies like that that rely on heavy equipment, they probably have lots more debt in its capital structure than, let's say, a software company. Tax rate, this is always important, so throw that into a factor no matter where you go. Uh, capital structure policies and guidelines. So this goes back to our conversation about the board of directors. Remember, and I'm going to repeat what I said before, but it's worth repeating. You know, the board essentially has two functions, and that's to establish uh, 
the strategic plan of the business. And the second part is to hire and fire uh, the executive leadership team. So embedded in both of those board functions is some kind of an idea about what's an acceptable capital structure. Do we want a little bit of debt? Do we want lots of debt in, uh, on the right-hand side of the balance sheet? And then something that we have talked about before as well, there are people out there, when I say people, I mean organizations like Moody's and Standard & Poor's and Fitch, who are third-party uh, ratings agencies that come into the company and they say, essentially, this is what they do. <laughs> they say, okay, here's, here's the total amount of debt and here's the total amount of annual operating cash flows. Well, that seems like an awful uh, uh, chance, an awful high chance that the firm is going to make those payments. That sounds like a AAA rated bond. Now, of course, it's much more complex than that. And those of you who are working for uh, Moody's and Standard & Poor's, you, you, you'll know that it's much more complex, but down at its base level, you're, you're making that initial comparison. External factors, of course, uh, I have a colleague at school who loves to talk about the environmental scan. You know, this is an end scan. So this is what we're doing here. Market conditions, you know, you can think about those in terms of how the Institute separates uh, readings into macroeconomic readings and microeconomic readings. So whatever we learn back in those readings are probably uh, relevant for these external factors, you know, things like inflation, things like price of oil, things like... Uh, you know, whether there are wars going on in different parts of the world. And then, of course, if you uh, when you do this environmental scan, you have to consider another group of people out there who are always interested in the activities of a business. And that other group of people, of course, are local governments and federal governments and other kinds of regulatory regulators out there who are interested in what we're doing. And then we need to ask ourselves the question, what, what are our uh, competitors doing? If, we're, if we have a debt equity ratio of, let's just say 0.5, and all of our competitors have a debt equity ratio of 0.2, I mean, that's an extreme example, but then we have to say, all right, you know, we have lots more leverage than our competition. Uh, are we magnifying returns enough to warrant that extra leverage? All right, so here's a couple of uh, slides that are gonna be more specific into what I was just saying about that previous slide. All right, so business model characteristics, so uh, revenue and cash volatility. Remember what I said to you guys back in the capital budgeting uh, reading about the goal of the business. We know it's to maximize shareholder wealth, but it's also to generate operating cash flows that are sustainable. You know, I love that word. And so I guess the opposite of sustainable cash flows would be highly volatile cash flows. So we need to worry about brand name product lines. We need to worry about new and higher standard deviations of those product lines. And so that gets into, you know, the earnings predictability. So relate that back to the branding and the sustainability. And then operating leverage, of course, what I was talking about in the previous slide was probably related to what's known as financial leverage, but there's also operating leverage in the use of all of these, uh, all of these fixed assets. Uh, asset type and asset ownership, uh, these should be obvious kinds of notions there. So how about existing leverage? We talked about this. So what I want you to do is I want you to take a look at that right-hand side. Let's, let's skip down to the bottom there, financial ratio. So all those financial ratios that we described in the earlier readings are appropriate and, and relevant factors that are going to impact capital structure. All right, do you want me to read these to you? Higher liquidity increases ability to support debt. That makes perfect sense. So here, the cool thing about that first arrow point is that not only are we worried about the bottom left and the bot and the and the middle of the right hand side of the balance sheet, but we're also worried about the top part. And that's why just a few readings ago, we had a great conversation about working capital management. So remember that working capital stuff that we talked about before and how it relates to the resulting liquidity ratios. Yeah, of course, if we have more profitability, we can, uh, we can afford to issue more bonds. That makes sense. Uh, higher leverage reduces the ability not only to issue new bonds, but also to support the, uh, interest pay the current interest payments. And then there's an interest coverage ratio there. We, we talked about that before. Corporate tax rate, yeah. Uh, what we'll learn, uh, one of the very last slides today is that uh, there's a trade-off between uh, 
uh, the tax advantage of debt. And so that's what we're talking about here, that uh, the higher the corporate tax rate, maybe let's call it the marginal income tax rate, that increases the tax benefit in the capital structure. So by no means am I suggesting here that uh, governments say, oh, let's go ahead and, uh, and assign a 50% or a 70% corporate tax rate here. But we need to be sensitive to the simple fact that whether the corporate tax rate, you know, in 2022 uh, in the U.S., it's you know, it's 21%. Of course, depending on who gets elected in 2024, <clears throat> that rate might, uh, might go up or down. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm guessing that no matter who gets elected, that'll probably go up. There's my little personal opinion there, but uh, so forget about that. Uh, capital structure policies and guidelines. So this is what I was saying about the board of directors. And of course, how we uh, view uh, the ability to magnify returns inside of the left-hand side of the balance sheet. And then here's a good slide on what those third-party uh, ratings agencies do. Notice what we have in bolded there, quality and safety of the company's debt. That's my little comparison of, the, of those two numbers. Uh, higher credit risk and default probabilities. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So what, what are we looking for here? Uh, as a good analyst, if we're uh, evaluating a company and individual bond issues, and uh, we have clients who say something like, you know what, I, I don't really like uh, financial risk. I'm happy to issue to invest in a bond, but I want a pretty safe bond. So what that does to us is that says, okay, let's go out and find AAA rated bonds or AA rated bonds, or maybe let's just include the entire universe of investment graded bonds. But there are some investors out there, there are lots of our clients, in fact, who are gonna say, you know what, I'm happy to take some extra risk. I'll go down to, uh, uh, you know, maybe a double B rated bond or, or maybe even a triple C rated bond. So it depends, it depends entirely on our clients' risk and return objectives. All right, external factors, I've already mentioned this here, but let me go ahead and look at that third block point in there. You know, the cost of debt, I mentioned the cost of equity or the required return on equity a few slides ago. So we, we need to make certain that we're aware of what that means in terms of our weighted average cost of capital, which we'll talk about here in just a few slides, but also in particular that cost of debt. And so I love this super simple formula here in that third block point. So the cost of a risky bond, you know, let's just pick a company like, uh, you know, Johnson & Johnson, which uh, in 2022 still has a AAA rating. And so we start with a risk-free rate of interest. So we'll look at the, we'll look at maybe the, I don't know, let's say the five-year treasury note yield to maturity, maybe the one year, you know, it kind of depends on a couple of different factors. And then we're going to add, you know, some basis points to that that are going to be reflective of the credit spread for that company. And so remember from your very first uh, finance class, you probably learned this, that the that credit spread unique to the company is a function of things like maybe a liquidity premium, maybe a maturity premium, maybe a default risk premium, uh, maybe an inflation premium, you know, maybe some other kinds of premiums out there that are going to add to the cost of the debt. So here's uh, here's what you need to make sure. I, I love asking these kind of questions on my exams. I'm guessing the Institute likes this. So we go back to the third party rating. What's a great question? You know, suppose we come up with a AAA rated bond. Well, what's that cost of debt going to be? It's going to be a risk free rate, you know, whatever that number is, <clears throat> plus a small credit spread. That makes sense. As opposed to, you know, let's suppose I'm, I'm Jim's concrete company and I stink at everything that I do and I have a bond out there that is, uh, it's double C rated. So what's my cost of debt gonna be? It's gonna be that same risk-free rate that we applied to the Johnson & Johnson bond, but now my credit spread, boy, I don't even know if you can see how far. So just think about Jim's stinky and rotten concrete company that has a huge uh, basis point credit spread. Uh, yeah, go down to the bottom. We have spent some time back in previous readings about the business cycle and the sectors and how they relate to the business cycle. So my advice is to go back over all those previous conversations and remind yourself that they could show up uh, on a test question uh, relating to this particular LOS. Uh, 
But I'm guessing the Institute kind of views this like the readings do and like I do and like uh, all good uh, finance PhDs do that, you know, each reading doesn't stand alone, that there are correlation coefficients between and among readings. So this particular part of this reading has a pretty high correlation coefficient to that to that earlier one. So here's the here are the organizations that I was talking about, uh, the governments and regulators. Uh, you know, so what do we have to do if we're uh, you know, if we're John Deere and we're making lawnmowers and farm equipment, you know, what do we have to do? We have to make certain that we make them as safe. I mean, you know, they have blades, you know, that cut, they cut grass and they cut corn and they cut wheat. So, so they have to have sharp instruments. And so, you know, there's got to be some kind of a regulation out there that says, you know, you can't have somebody, you know, a machine, you know, just throwing swords all over the place, like, uh, you know, like in a Lord of the Rings movie. Uh, however, that regulation is very different than what we see in the financial uh, services industry, which you know I'm guessing most of you guys uh, uh, work for. So you know all about the regulatory constraints. And then switch over to public utility companies. I'll just say this briefly: that of course, uh, you know there are regulators that come and say to uh, the water company uh, that serves the water in our household. They say, you know what, you can only charge, you know. 10 cents for a ton of water. I have no idea what the water rate is. So I just made that number up. And here's part of the end scan where we're going to go ahead and look at our competition. Uh, I'm always fascinated by uh, comparing companies inside of the industry with the peers. I always, of course, go back to some of my favorite James Bond movies where there's uh, you know, espionage within and between and among all different si sorts of companies. You know, James Bond makes it appear to be, uh, you know, pretty fascinating and exciting. Uh, but I'm guessing there's some uh, espionage going out there. <clears throat> All right, how about ne the next LOS? Uh, let's look at life cycle. So think about a company that goes like this, starts like this, and then here, and then here, and then here. So in this startup stage, uh, boy, revenues are zero to minimal. That means that business risks are high. So think about, you know, if you have zero revenues, you got tons and tons of expenses over here on the left hand side uh, of the income statement. That's that's business risk right there. So what happens here uh, we will probably have to raise capital privately. Uh, we probably have customers out there that are paying us cash, you know, not always, but some. And if we go to the bank, uh, the banker might say to us as a startup, you know, we're happy to lend you some money. You know, you want this much, we'll, we'll lend you this much, just a small portion of it. And we're going to charge you 20% or something there. So uh, high costs, you know, unstable and negative cash flows. So it's probably either high cost or unavailable. That's, that's a great exam question, by the way. And that's why... <clears throat> And of course, the Institute is keenly aware of this. You know, we have multiple readings on private equity firms and venture capital. And so once again, let me go ahead and link this particular LOS with those other readings. And so we'll talk at length in other readings, and especially level two and even level three about uh, about those other forms. All right, so how about growth? So now, now we have our feet wet, right? We're standing in the ocean or we're standing on the beach and we have the water coming up to our ankles. So now we need to get the courage up to say something like, all right, it's time to go into our wastes. And uh, what I want you to do is think about <clears throat> going out into the ocean in Maine, you know, maybe in May. And so you walk out there and that water's freezing cold. So there are lots and lots of risks. However, once you get used to the water, then there are great, uh, there are great returns. Uh, I will comment that if I were in Maine in May, I probably wouldn't get in the water. <laughs> All right, so we start uh, we start generating revenues. And so what happens to our business risk, which was super high in the previous stage, now comes down. But there's still lots and lots of business risk. But as the revenue increases, then the executive leadership team looks over on the left hand side of the balance sheet and says, boy, we have these revenues and we're just targeting this market over here in this one small market. If we could have 10 times the assets over here, oh my gosh, then our revenues would take off and then our cash flows would follow. And so the question then becomes, you know, how do we pay for those types of assets? So that's that second arrow point there. More investment is needed to achieve growth and uh, 
and economies of scale and maybe even economies of scope. So we're progressing then through this growth stage where those risks increase, which is what I just, I'm sorry, which the, when the particular risks decrease like uh, competition and execution because we get smarter and smarter as, as we go through this. Cash flows become positive and bankers who were, let me go back here, bankers who were unwilling to lend us money back here when we were standing with just the water up to our ankles, now they look at us and they see it up to our waist and they say, oh man, that water's cold. These must be really, really tough men and women. Let's go ahead and provide them with some capital. But we're still not gonna ignore equity, of course. All right, so mature stage. So think of this stage as the stage where the product lines become branded, which means uh, revenue is uh, revenue growth is slow, could be even decreasing, and that's probably a good exam question. Cash flows are positive and sustainable. I'm going to use my word and not the word that is used in, in the reading. Business risk becomes low. You've heard me say this before. It's worth repeating at this at this stage of the recording. If Milton Hershey wakes up today and says, I want to make a million Hershey kisses, what does he know he's going to be able to do with those one million Hershey kisses? He knows he's going to be able to sell them. That means branded product lines. That means low business risk. Now, what we can do is we can get away with issuing commercial paper in the short term. I mean, this reading is really not about commercial paper, but this links us back to our working capital discussion. Uh, you know, remember, working capital is pretty much unsecured debt, but then we can also issue a bond uh, that doesn't have to be secured by any of our assets. Now, during the mature stage, there is some possibility that the firm lessens its reliance on those debt securities, maybe the 10 year bonds or maybe even the 20 year bonds, maybe they uh, mature and so they're paid off. And so uh, typically what happens then is this is a natural deleveraging process, um, but it also can deleverage because our, what's the goal of the business? Maximize shareholder wealth. So when the equity portion of the balance sheet is swelling, that means there's more equity in capital structure and less debt. Remember that debt is a fixed amount. So I love this last uh, uh, this last block point there. What are offsetting deleveraging activities? And of course, what do mature firms do? They pay dividends and they repurchase their shares all the time. Let me go ahead and take off my my hat here and put in my just my let's be sensitive about the political environment. Uh, at least in the United States, there are politicians out there who are very concerned about firms repurchasing their shares and are questioning, uh, questioning those decisions. Okay, let me put my other hat back on. All right, so what do I tell you guys to do regularly? Get out your phone and take a picture of this slide and put it in a folder of all of the pictures that I have asked you to take. So this is really a good summary of what we've been talking about over the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes. All right, how about some unique situations? <clears throat> I like these terms here that the reading uses capital intensive business, you know, think of uh, John Deere, marketable assets. You know, if John, wanted, if John woke up today and said, hey, I wanna sell, uh, you know, my, my lawnmower uh, uh, product line, there'd probably be a lot of people that would uh, show up and say, all right, well, we'll take over that, you know? So regardless of the development stage, they're probably gonna continue using those high leverages as opposed to capital light businesses, which are probably software companies or maybe some tech, tech companies there. And so, oops, I didn't mean to do that. So um, uh, remember those, if you can remember those two definitions, capital intensive and capital light businesses, uh, I think you can answer those two questions. All right, let's go ahead and swing back to 1958. Let's get in our time machine. Let's drive uh, 88 miles per hour. Franco Modigliani and Merton Miller uh, published this paper that was uh, the seminal paper in finance. In fact, uh, it is recognized as the time period where the discipline of finance was created. And so what's fascinating to me about this article, and by the way, I get it out and I... I read it once a year, even as a 61-year-old uh, college professor, because it really is a thing of beauty in terms of its simplistic language. 
but it's also a thing of beauty in its application of calculus. And I've, I think I've said that to you guys before. All right, so what do we know? Let me, let's me let skip to that second uh, diamond point. Goal of the business, what do we know? We want to who, maximize shareholder wealth. How do we do it? Well, we've said this before. We've said that we want to make something for pennies and sell it for dollars, which means we want to generate lots of cash flows. We want to find branded product lines. So now we're extending that. How do we maximize shareholder wealth? Well, we do it by finding the capital structure, right? Go back up to that blue diamond point, the mix of debt and equity, an optimal capital structure that is going to minimize the weighted average cost of capital. And so remember that in order to compute a present value, we need a discount rate. So if we're gonna, if we're gonna compute a present value of let's just say free cash flows, we need some kind of an interest rate. Let's just, uh, let's just go ahead and say it's the weighted average cost of capital. If we minimize the denominator, then we maximize the present value of the numerator. So I'm going to add minimizing the weighted average cost of capital as we go through the rest of the slides here in all of these readings <clears throat> as part of the goal to maximize shareholder wealth. So there's a good equation down there. There are actually two of them uh, about the weighted average cost of capital. Uh, I want you to look at the right hand one first. So this is, uh, this is really just uh, an average interest rate, weighted average cost of capital, it's an interest rate. And so let's just suppose that I'm Jim's concrete company <clears throat> and I come to you guys as my investors and say, hey, I need a bunch of money. And let's suppose that there are a third of you who say, hey, you know what, we'll lend you a bond. So you're my bond holders. So one third would be that WD, the weight in debt. And then the R sub D, that's going to be your required return. So you're going to say to me, hey, Jim, we're going to charge you 10% to lend you all this capital. So there's the RD, the before tax cost of debt. And then we multiply it by one minus the tax rate to illustrate the simple fact that the firm is allowed to take its interest expense off of the income statement, which lowers its tax liability. So make sure you don't forget to do the one minus the tax rate if the question STEM asks you uh, to consider a taxable environment. And then let's suppose another third of you are my preferred shareholders. So you say, we'll lend you a third and we're gonna charge you 12%. So that WP is the, is the weight in the preferred stock, that would be one third. And then the return uh, R sub P is the uh, required return on preferred stock or the uh, cost of preferred stock. Let me go ahead and say this right now. I have nothing interesting to say about preferred stock. And so hopefully it just goes away uh, uh, for the rest of the slide deck here. There's a wink, wink and a nudge, nudge by me. And then of course, let's suppose uh, that the last third of you guys say, hey, Jim, we'll lend you the last third. That's the weight in equity. And then you're gonna charge me 17% or so. So that weighted average cost of capital would be one third of the, what did I say? 10% for the bond, one third of the 12% of the preferred stock and one third of the 17% of the uh, common stock. Don't forget to take one minus the tax rate over there on, uh, on the before tax cost of equity. I'm sorry, the before tax cost of debt. So skip over to the left-hand side. So this is a, just a little bit different version of the formula. Notice in red and in blue, we have a different, <clears throat> the explicit formula for the weights. That would be the one-third and the one-third. Now here on that left-hand side, we just, uh, we just throw out the preferred stock. Look at the bottom there. Since we're starting with Medigliani and Miller, they were the first two to tell us that the value of the firm is equal to the market value of the debt and the market value of the equity. All right, so in 1958, Medigliani and Miller created this world. They had a bunch of assumptions and a bunch of limiting uh, restrictions, as I call them. And so I always tell my students to think of this as the M&M world. It's not the world that reflects reality in any way. And when Medigliani and Miller released this paper, uh, a lot of people were critical of it because it didn't really reflect reality. But this is the beauty of it. This is why Medigliani and Miller won the Nobel Prize in economics, because they said something like, all right, come into our world. Believe what we believe here in our world. And we're going to teach you tremendously value valuable lessons 
about how to value a company. And then feel free to let go of all of our assumptions until it approaches reality. And what you learned at the core is going to help you learn reality. And I'll show you a graph about reality, which would not exist unless Medigliani and Miller came up with this. All right, so uh, explain these propositions. We'll do that in a slide or two, but make sure that you memorize these assumptions. These, these, are, great, uh, these are great exam questions. So part one, what are we saying here? We're saying that you and I, we have the same information set, homogeneous expectations. So not only do we know what's on the income statement and the balance sheet and the cash flow statement, we know everything about, uh, we know everything about the firm. What that means then is that we're all going to arrive at the same conclusions. So what the reading does is it tells you that investors agree on a given investment's expected cash flows. All right, so think about what that means. That doesn't mean that, uh, that we're all super smart. All it means is that we have the same information, we process it the same way, and we arrive at the same conclusion. Now, clearly, clearly, this is a limiting assumption. But let's go ahead and just assume that we're all robots, and we all come up with the same conclusion. Now, we'll relax that assumption at some point in time, all right? Perfect capital markets. A lot of people didn't like this in 1958. No transaction costs, right? So there was no bid-ask spread. There were no taxes. All right, so think about a world without a government out there, right? There are no bankruptcy costs. So we're going to call these financial distress costs. So there's, there's no need for Moody's or Standard & Poor's, right? There's no chance of bankruptcy. So now you should be thinking, boy, this is really, this is really a world that probably doesn't exist. But hold off, I'm telling you. I promise you it's going to be worth it in the end. Uh, investors can borrow and lend at the risk-free rate. This sounds like a terrible limiting assumption, but it's not really. You know, investors uh, uh, can get fairly close. Some investors can get fairly close to uh, that treasury yield. But of course, you, you and I are probably not one of those investors. Uh, yeah, no agency costs. So what's the goal of the business? Maximize shareholder wealth. So executives are not tempted to excess consume some of those perks and salaries and bonuses. And then here's a really cool one here. Uh, financing and investment decisions are independent of each other, which means that when we invest in a positive net present value project over on the left-hand side of the balance sheet, we don't, whoops, sorry, I hit my, uh, we don't really care what happens over on the right-hand side of the balance sheet. Financing and investment decisions are independent of each other. All right, so let's go ahead and dive into the m and pool. We're going to talk about Proposition 1 and Proposition 2. So here, here is one where we are in the entirely small m and world. You ready for this? This is something that you, uh, this is a statement you should memorize, not just for today, not just for the exam, but in 40 years, when I see you out on the street and I'll say, what is proposition one? You should go like this. Oh, the market value of a company is not affected by the capital structure of the firm. All right, so what does that tell us? That uh, we issue a bond, we issue shares of stock on the right-hand side. Maybe it's a 0.5 debt equity ratio. Well. Whether we change that 0.5 to 0.25 or 0.75, the value of the company is going to be identical in all different capital structures of the firm. So think of this proposition one as the right-hand side of the balance sheet. Think about just if you could magically change the debt equity ratio from 0.1 to 0.2 to 0.3 to 0.4 to 0.5 to 0.6, all, all the way to some number. If you could just magically change that the value of the bonds, the value of the shares of stock, in other words, the market value of the company would not change. Well, what does that mean? Look at the implication. The value of the levered company, a company with bonds, is equal to the value of an unlevered company, a company without bonds in its, in its capital structure. So there's a good equation there right at the bottom. And what I'm going to do is just pause and tell you what is so awesome about this little world. So Medigliani and Miller, they say, don't worry about the right-hand side of the balance sheet. Worry about, are you ready for this? The quality of the assets. 
the ability of those product lines to generate lots and lots of revenues and minimize expenses. So look at the numerator, EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes. Now, this was the term that M&M used back in 1958, <clears throat> but I'm clearly okay with just substituting some version of cash flow in that numerator, maybe operating cash flow, maybe free cash flow. But what I want you to do is I want you to think about this. When Dick Leany and Miller, they said, don't worry about the bonds and the equity over on the right-hand side of the balance sheet. Worry about the left-hand side of the balance sheet in terms of its ability to generate cash flows. So I always tell my students to write this on my exams. Medigliani and Miller, what do they do? They tell us that the value of the firm is a function of two things. The quality of the assets, the quality of the product lines, the quality of that property, plant, and equipment, which is proxied here in 1958 by earnings before interest and taxes. All right. So what M&M decided in 1958 is they came up with this idea that there's a no growth firm. In other words, if the company was going to generate 100 in EBIT in year one, then it was going to generate 100 in EBIT in year two and three and four and five and 10 and 20 and 50, right? A no growth firm. This is another reason why lots of people didn't like this paper. <clears throat> but what M&M did is they focused our attention. They lasered our attention. They said, look, don't worry about these minor details. Worry about the major core, the body and soul of a company is its ability to generate EBIT. And then, of course, you have to do it in present value terms. So we're going to divide by the weighted average cost of capital, which there's the repeat of the formula there down at the bottom. All right, so two things, two things from Proposition 1. Remember the explicit nature of it. And there's, I'll read this quote again. Market value of a company is not affected by the capital structure of the firm. And by the way, I'm going to prove this here in just, uh, in just a slide or two. But what does M&M tell us about this? They say, look, focus on two things, quality of the asset and the weighted average cost of capital. Now, Proposition 2, of course, is related to Prop Proposition 1. And remember, in 1958, we were just coming to the idea of this linear relationship. Remember, uh, Harry Markowitz in 1952 gave us the efficient frontier. And then in 1964, William Sharp gave us the capital asset pricing model. So all of these, uh, all of these fa founding fathers of finance were, in their own way, coming to the same con conclusion. They were converging on this idea of linearity between some kinds of variables that are important in this new discipline of finance. So let me go ahead and read Proposition 2 without taxes. The cost of equity is a linear function of the company's debt equity ratio. And of course, this is why I've been using the debt equity ratio as an example, you know, throughout this slide deck. So skip down to the middle of the page. And so what do we have? We have the required return on equity or the cost of equity. Remember, we can interchange those two terms. It's depending on whether we're viewing this number from the investor standpoint or from the uh, borrower or the corporation standpoint. So that R sub O is the cost of capital if there is no debt financing, right? So this is a totally, uh, totally unlevered firm. And then what are we going to do is we're going to just add this extra stuff that arises because of the bond issue. And so notice we have debt equity ratio out in parentheses on the right hand side. And so all we're going to do is take the difference between that unlevered cost of capital minus the required return on debt or the cost of debt. Now, what happens is that the weighted average cost of capital remains constant. You're going to see that here in just a second. All right, so some of these implications here. Higher leverage increases the cost of equity. We just showed that to you here linearly, but does not change the company's value. And that's because the increase in equity is going to be exactly offset by the greater proportion of the use of debt. And we're going to go ahead and show that here in an example. So this will take us a couple of slides. So take a deep breath and uh, let's work through this. So we have a company here financed only by equity. All right, so no debt in its capital structure. Uh, it generates cash flow, $10,000, cost of equity of 10%. All right, so this is going to be an easy first calculation and probably easy secondary calculations as well. 
All right, so we've got a couple of tasks here. Ready? So assuming M&M proposition one, the company's perpetual cash flow is closest to, well, this was that easy math. So all we're going to do is take that $10,000. So remember, so this is key. What did I say to you in 1958? M&M used EBIT because that's just what everybody used back in, in those days. But now in this example, and I warned you about this a moment ago, we're going to substitute cash flow. So this is an annual uh fixed cash flow of $10,000 to get the present value. This is the present value of a perpetual annuity. Remember, we talked about that in our uh, in our time value of money reading. And then we're just going to divide by the decimal form of the cost of equity, because remember, it's an all it's an all uh, all equity firm. So there's the value of the firm $100,000. Uh, what do we have in bold there? Cost of equity is also weighted average. Oh, wow. well, I just said this, right? It's all, it's, there is no debt in the capital structure. So those two numbers are going to be the same, of course. All right, so part two, if the company is planning to issue 20,000 in debt and use the proceeds to repurchase stock, what is the cost of equity going to be? All right, so this is very cool. This is exactly what Medigliani and Miller did in this 1958. Uh, 58 paper. They said something like, all right, the company has uh, total finance by equity over on the right-hand side of the balance sheet. Let's suppose we issue bonds and we repurchase some of the shares. All right. So you go from, you go from zero debt in the capital structure to some debt in the capital structure. So think about what we're doing here. In this debt equity ratio, we're going to increase the numerator and decrease the nom denominator debt equity. All right, so what the cost of equity is closest to, well, let's go ahead and start with our 10%, right? And we're going to add the difference between the 10 and the 5, and then we're going to put our new, our new, debt equity ratio in there. You know, what did it used to be? It used to be zero over 100, right? Now it's going to be 20. And we're going to take that 20 and we're re repurchasing 20,000 in equity. So we're only left with, we're only left with 80,000. So that's the 20 over 80 over on the far right side. So that means that our uh, cost of equity, which look up at the very top, Cost of equity is 10%. Now our cost of equity is 11.25%. So you should be shaking your heads and you should be saying, wait a minute, Jim. When we did, let me go back here real quick. When we did this calculation here, we did 10,000 divided by 10% and we got 100,000. Didn't you just tell us that m and say that the value of the firm, that 100,000 is not going to change? Well, if the if the 10% changes to 11%, 11.25, well, surely, surely if we're increasing the denominator, then the present value has to fall. Ah, but that's not the case because we used to have 0% in our debt, but now we have something in our debt. All right, so look at this. This is so cool. I ask my students this all the time on exams. To me, if I were creating the CFA Institute exam, I would not create one without this question. All right, so what is our weighted average cost of capital? All right, so remember, we're issuing this debt at a cost of 5%. So now we have a weight in debt of 20 out of 100 times the 5% plus the 80 out of 100 which is our new debt to asset ratio. We're doing debt to asset, right? Uh, times the 1125. Oh my goodness gracious. We're still left with 10%. We're still left with 10%. Do, how many times do I need to repeat this? We're still left with a weighted average cost of capital of 10%. So if I go back here, I still have my no growth company. We still have $10,000 in annual operating cash flows. And now we're still going to divide by 10% because that combines the lower cost of debt, which was 5%, and the higher cost of equity, which was 11 and a quarter, but the mathematics of it uh, don't change. It's still 10%, so the value of the firm is still $100,000. So I'm gonna go ahead and let you guys stand up and give Medigliani and Miller a round of applause. I want you to do cartwheels around your room. Now, let me assure you, that Medigliani and Miller did not win the Nobel Prize in economics because they, pro they proved that 10% equals 
this was the result of some super cool calculus. And in fact, the calculus of this article, it flows like a beautiful symphony. In fact, when I go back and reread re this article every year, I have trumpets and violins and all sorts of crazy things playing in my brain. <laughs> How's that for Sil silly imagery? You never knew that M&M could be so terribly exciting. So what, what are we concluding here? We're, we're going to do, what's that example? Proposition one and two without taxes. So we did this, but what should our focus be? As good analysts, our focus should always be on evaluating the firm's ability to generate cash flows from its assets and its ability to go to the external markets and say, hey, you people over there, we need a bunch of money. Will you lend it to me? And having those people look at us and say, hey, you know what? We really like what we see. We're going to lend you money and we're going to lend you capital at a low interest rate. Ah, there's that last part I was talking about, minimizing the weighted average cost of capital. And so here's a real simple uh, equation to show that we're just, uh, we can do this a different way to discount. So we take the 1,000 in the bond issue divided by the 5%. We take the 9,000 and uh, uh, divide that by the 1125 and we get our $100,000. So this is a really cool formula down there or equation that says that the value of the firm is equal to the market value of the debt and the market value of the equity. How cool is that? All right, so what did I say to you? We've been in this Medigliani and Miller world, and granted, it's, it's not a reflection of the way real world stuff works. So let's go ahead and say something like, oh, let's suppose that there are really governments out there and they, and they have tax liabilities imposed on us. So you ready for this? Proposition one with taxes. The market value of a levered company is equal to the value of the unlevered company plus the value of the debt tax shield. Oh my gosh, this is so important. So now every time we issue a bond, we lower our tax liability. So how are firms going to maximize shareholder wealth? Well, they're, they're always gonna issue a bond. They're gonna issue a bond and repurchase shares. Issue a bond and repurchase shares. They're gonna do this every day and every day until there are no common shares outstanding, right? Because the value of that tax shield goes up and up and up linearly, by the way, all right, so look at that equation in the middle. Value of the levered firm is equal to the value of the unlevered firm plus the tax shield. And that's a present value too, by the way. And that's, uh, that's in purple. So go ahead and skip to the very bottom. So the value of the unlevered firm, we've got to make sure that we take one minus the tax rate out of our earnings before interest and taxes before we divide by the weighted average cost of capital. So there we go. Notice in parentheses, we say all cash flows are perpetual. This is that M&M &M assumption about a no growth firm. Yeah, how about some implications here? This is what I was trying to say about this linear relationship. A profitable company can increase its value by employing more and more debt, right? So the higher the tax rate, then the greater is this, uh, is this profitability. All right, so then what about this linear relationship? Uh, we have to have an adjustment for the tax rate. So we're going to use the same equation that we did before, but we're going to throw that, that one minus the tax rate in there. So go ahead and get out your uh, phones and take a picture of this one here. Uh, proposition one and two with taxes and proposition one and two without taxes. Um, notice that the LOS asks us to explain this and we're going to go through an example here again in the next slide. But if you look at the really, really super cool 25 questions at the end of this reading, there are lots of computes and calculates. So I would make sure you, you could do the math uh, that we've done so far and even this example here. So we have EBIT of 6,000. So we have a bunch of stuff uh, going down the teardrops on the left-hand side. Calculate the value of the firm. Calculate uh, the value of the firm uh, with, uh, with taxes. So let's go ahead and do this. Um, what we're going to do is simply take the value of the uh, unlevered company. So we've got the 6,000. Don't forget to take uh, one minus the 30% uh, tax rate out divided by weighted average cost of capital of 12. So there's the value of the unlevered company, 35,000. But now, now 
uh, well, we have 18,000 in debt there. So what we want to do is multiply 18,000 times that 30. There's the purple, right? T times D. So that gets us up to $40,400. So I'm going to go ahead and repeat what I said earlier. I mean, think about it. What is M&M telling us? That the majority, the overwhelming majority of the value of a company comes in its ability to generate cash flows. That's the $35,000. And then Medigliani and Miller are willing to agree that there are governments out there and they impose tax liabilities on companies. So we're going to add another $5,400 just because we have to pay taxes and because the interest expense is tax deductible. Now, how about if we do, uh, if we go th work through some cost of equity calculations here? So what's the, uh, what's the difference between what we computed before? So there we got the 40,400, subtract that $18,000 in debt, and we're left with $22,400 worth of equity. So let's go ahead and throw a bunch of those numbers in here. This will be the second time that we've done this. So we start with 12. Here, let me just go back here. Did you guys take a picture of this one? I don't think you did. There's the 12% weighted average cost of capital. So we'll add the parentheses there, 12 minus 6. We'll take 1 minus the tax rate again. And now we have 18, uh, 18 over 22.4, right? Debt equity ratio. And that gets us a little over 15%. 15, uh, 15 All right. So what we can do is we can go ahead and uh, recompute the value of the firm using those present value calculations. So we'll take 6% times the 18,000, then we'll divide by 6% in that first, uh, that first ratio to the left of the plus sign underneath the V equals D plus E. And then we'll go ahead and take the uh, 6,000 minus the interest expense and one minus the tax rate, right? So there's divide that by 15 and there you get the 40,000. So we come up with that 40,400 and then you can work through the weighted average cost of capital below to get that 10.4%. And there we go. We get about 40,400. So there are a handful of ways of explaining and demonstrating and computing the M&M, what did they say? Value of the firm equals the value of the debt plus the value of the equity. All right, let's go ahead and let, here we go. We, we were here, right, in our M&M world. We let the taxes come involved. Now let's throw away that assumption where we said, what was that assumption? I'm not going to go way back. There was something in there that says that, hey, we don't have any financial distress or bankruptcy costs. Oh, man. All right, so let's relax this assumption. And what this does is this throws a whole bunch of stuff into the M&M world. So the M&M world was like this, its original world. And then with the taxes, it got to be this big. And now when we allow financial distress costs to enter into the model, now we're really approaching reality here. And I'll show you that in, in just a, a few seconds. All right, so the reading does distinguish between direct financial distress costs, which are actual cash expenses related to bankruptcy. Just think about costs paying a lawyer. But then indirect costs, and this is the way I explain this to my students all the time. I say, look, let's suppose you're the executive, and five years ago, you issued a bond for a billion dollars. And uh, it worked out okay for a while, but now the assets that you invested in, they are not paying off. So your decision to issue the bond and to invest in these assets is not really paying off. So you are stressed out. You don't know if you can make the next coupon payment to all of the bondholders out there. So you're totally stressed out. So you drive to work, you know, and, you're, and your hands are grip, grip, gripping the wheel and you, you know, you're yelling at all the people around there or cutting you off. You get to your office, you slam your car door, you go, you go and now remember, you're worried about making this coupon payment, you know, and everyone says to you, uh, good morning, good morning, how are you? And you go like this, you go, rah! Oh my gosh, so you upset everybody because you're upset, so now everyone is totally stressed out. Now, I know these are not called uh, financial stressed out costs, but what happens if everyone is stressed out here? You, loot, you don't treat your customers well, you don't treat your creditors and your suppliers, your people on that supply chain side, the people on this supply chain side. Then you have all these agency costs here. All right, so think of those indirect costs as, you ready for this? 
This is the way the Institute might, this is the way I would do it on an exam. The Institute might say something like, there is a loss of efficiency in the operations of the company. So with that one, with that one little short phrase, the Institute can throw all of those indirect costs in there. All right, what are some uh, expectations down there at the bottom? So uh, financial distress costs increase as the relative cost of debt finance. All right, that makes sense, right? If the bondholders are saying, if the bondholders used to say, hey, Jim, we'll charge you 10%. Now they come to us and say, all right, we'll charge you 13% or 15% or 20%. That makes sense. Reduces the value of the firm, right? So we have, we have this interest subsidy that we've talked about, but now, these financial distress costs start to eat into that, uh, that subsidy. And of course, it's going to affect the cost of debt and the cost of equity so that perhaps, perhaps this just throws m and Proposition 1 and 2 right out the window. But what this does, considering taxes and considering financial distress costs, this leads us to something that we can call an optimal capital structure. And even though Modigliani and Miller didn't talk about this in 1958, this is what they were leading to. And subsequent researchers over the years uh, came up with this idea of an optimal capital structure. So in the presence of corporate taxes and financial distress costs, there is a unique debt equity ratio here. All right, so effective leverage, a unique debt equity ratio that will maximize the value of the firm. What it's going to do is it's going to say, all right, you ready for this? You guys know this from our old time discussion. There are marginal benefits of issuing a bond. There are marginal costs of issuing a bond. What are the marginal benefits? The tax subsidy. What are the marginal costs, the financial distress costs? So of course, we have to weigh those two. And when those marginal costs are identical, that's when the firm value is maximized. So look at that middle block point. The modification of the M&M proposition, value of the levered firm is equal to the value of the unlevered firm, minus the, I'm sorry, plus the tax shield, which is a present value, by the way, I said that earlier, minus the present value of the financial distressed costs. So remember what I said to you a few moments ago, I said, I'm gonna show you a picture and this is gonna make everything look so cool because what we did is we started with the core of Medigliani and Miller and then we allowed all of these other things to enter into the model and this is what we're gonna come up with. In fact, if I were creating an exam, which I do all the time for my students, I show them this picture. All right, you ready? So look on the vertical axis. So there's the market value of the firm. Now, what's our goal? Our goal is to make that number super high, right? Notice that there's a measure of leverage on the horizontal axis. We'll call that the debt equity ratio from zero all the way out. All right, let's go ahead and start with the green, right? So let's go up. What's the value of the unlevered firm? So from the horizontal axis, up to the green line, this is a measure of the quality of the assets. This is how much the firm is able to generate sustainable cash flows. But then what can we do? Well, if we have no debt in our capital structure back there at the origin, the, the intersection of the green line and the vertical axis, we can just start issuing a bond. This is the dotted blue line. Notice all the way up at the top, value of the levered firm. This is what I was saying to you earlier, that if we have the M&M world plus just taxes, then the executives, they're just gonna issue a bond every day. Issue a bond, repurchase shares. Issue a bond, repurchase shares. And that's a line, right? So there's our linear relationship again. So we're gonna get way, way out there to an optimal capital structure with just taxes. Now this is in calculus called a corner solution. And a lot of times corner solutions make absolutely no sense. And this thing makes absolutely no sense as well. What this says is that the firm can benefit itself by getting rid of all of its shareholders. Well, we see that we don't observe that. And so that doesn't happen because what did Medigliani and Miller ignore? They ignored bankruptcy costs. So that dotted blue line ignores bankruptcy costs. All right, so we went from one extreme to the other. So let's go ahead and say, what if we allow taxes and financial distress costs? Now we're at the red line. So what's happening here? The interest tax shield is very powerful. 
when we go from a debt equity ratio of zero to 0.1 to 0.2. That's why we have a positive and uh, upwards and substantial slope. But what happens as we start hitting a point where financial distress costs enter into the model. Notice that it starts downward, not downward, the slope becomes less and less steep until it hits a slope of zero. Ah, look up at the top. Marginal increase in the present value of the tax shield equals the marginal increase in the present value of the financial distress cost. This is what I was saying earlier. So that O star point is an optimal debt equity ratio. It's an optimal capital structure. All right, so you ready? Now I'm giving Medigliani and Miller full credit for all of this because they laid the foundation, but there were other researchers who came along after them who said something like, look, what is the market value of the firm? Let's go up that left-hand uh, left vertical axis. The market value of the firm is a function of the quality of the assets and the weighted average cost of capital, right? The green line. But then how do we add value? We find an optimal capital structure. So in Medigliani and Miller's little world, what was that proposition one? Market value is unaffected by capital structure. Well, now we found out that it is. But we couldn't get to this point without entering the simple M&M world. They got us to the point where we can now say, okay, financial distress costs, tax implications, so now we're considering governments, now we're considering bankruptcy and Moody's and Standard & Poor's, we're thinking of indirect financial distress, we're thinking of agency costs, we're thinking of all this stuff in there. So this graph here, this nearly reflects the reality of what corporations are faced with in terms of maximizing shareholder wealth. So what do we do? How do we maximize shareholder wealth? We find projects that have lots and lots of cash flows and we find the optimal capital structure on the right-hand side of the balance sheet. Feel free to give Medigliani and Miller another round of applause. All right, so here's kind of a summary page uh, of that previous slide. So lower levels of debt, tax benefit of debt exceeds. That's why we're doing the op op upward slope. But as more debt is added, financial distress costs start to increase significantly. We've got more debt beyond there. That is going to reduce firm value. And then that point O is called an optimal capital structure. Now, an article that I read back in my graduate school days was a really cool article. And it said something like, you know what, in, let me go back to this, uh, let me go back. It looks to me from this, uh, from this equation and this illustration that there's one optimal debt equity ratio, like, you know, 0.7621, some number there. But what we really find out is there's a range of optimal capital structures. And that's what we're doing uh, that's what we're doing here. Look at that second block point. Managers cannot identify O star with precision. So this article that I was telling you about allowed executives to find a range of capital structures. And so that brings up the concept of a target capital structure. And so a target capital structure might be between, I'll make up some numbers. What did I say earlier? Like 0.76 something, something. So maybe a target capital structure is going to be maybe 0.72 to 0.78 of an optimal debt equity range. And of course, there are functions of tax rates, business risk, governance, financial accounting, and all that other stuff that, uh, that we've talked about. So I want you to think about this. Uh, you know, this LOS is really, really not one particular lasered point, but a range of points. Uh, remember that when you compute optimal capital structure, you're going to use market values. Remember that when you look on the balance sheet, uh, you're going to find book values. Uh, here's a summary of just how we're going to compute the weights. These are just with uh, these are just with market values. Uh, not a whole lot of new stuff on this slide. Here's uh, here's another. Uh, kind of a summary of what we've been talking about. But something that's additional here is that, remember, the executives of the business, they're going to know what those 
book values are every day and what those market values are every day. But we, as outside financial analysts, boy, we're going to have to make an estimate. And so that's why the Institute is asking us to know all of this stuff, right, from level one all the way up to level three, so that we can make better better and more informed estimates of what those, uh, what, here, let me go back here real quick, of what these weights are so that we can actually figure out as executives what those optimal weights are going to be. Now, a couple final things before we end this slide deck. So pecking order theory, this is super easy. In fact, I want you to go to those uh, problems at the end of the reading. Uh, number 25, the very last one is one of these pecking order questions here. So what do we prefer? We prefer internally generated funds, then debt, then equity, mostly because uh, it, it, they increase in their expense. A um, couple of things about agency costs here that uh, uh, agency costs theory predicts that um, when we increase the use of debt, there's probably going to be some impact on the agency cost of equity. And you see there in the slide that well, that's probably going to be reduced, maybe not in every case, but probably. More leverage reduces the opportunity for manage, management to spend foolishly, right? When they're locked into that explicit promise, then they're probably going to have a less incentive for that excess consumption. And that probably relates to what I was saying earlier about the reduction in agency conflict. Uh, yeah, we know all about uh, the stakeholder interests here. So, um, you know, bondholders, what do they want? Bondholders want the executives to invest in low risk projects. Uh, shareholders want the executives to invest in, in high-risk projects. And so there's this uh, possibility that we can find an optimal capital structure that will minimize this uh, debt, the, the bondholder versus the shareholder conflict. A couple other final things to consider uh, whether, you know, on the right-hand side of the balance sheet, do we have senior bonds and how many junior bonds do we have? What are their maturity dates? What are their durations? You know, the reading doesn't mention anything about duration, but you probably, you probably ought to think about duration here. And then all of the covenants that are in the, uh, uh, in the debenture, which we've, uh, which we've talked about before. I'm sorry, the indenture that we have talked about before. Preferred shareholders, I have absolutely nothing of interest to say about preferred shareholders, uh, but this is what you need to know for the exam. Uh, they are always oftentimes considered hybrid securities. So they have some characteristics that make them look like bonds. You know, the preferred shares typically pay a fixed dividend. They don't have to, but typically they pay a fixed dividend. So that looks like a fixed coupon payment, but then they don't mature so that they, uh, that they look a little bit like equity. So they're ahead of common stock, but behind of debt. And there is no covenant protection there. Um, I think I've already said this about uh, the board of directors hired to maximize shareholder wealth. Yeah. So go back to the board of directors and the compensation committee. So that compensation committee is responsible for putting together contracts that lessen the agency conflict and align the interests of the shareholders and the uh, executive leadership team. So this, this goes back to our conversation with the board. Boy, I told you that was a long one, but uh, I think this was super helpful. Uh, I loved going through this. I love talking about Medigliani and Miller. So go, go work on those 25 problems. Bring your calculator. You know, even though none of these learning outcome statements say to compute or calculate, the readings, the readings ask you to do so. One final thing I'll say, and I'm going to swing back to our working capital discussion as well, that a handful of these problems have some vignettes. So there'll be a question stem that says these, uh, uh, this question stem relates to the following three or four questions. So I, I love those. And, uh, you know, you'll be fully exposed to those types of questions at level three and level two. So, hey, thanks for watching. Uh, have a great day and good luck studying.